Hello, Happy New Year. Welcome to Medical Ethics. I am Professor Ryan Cook. I will be your lecturer for this class. We will get started immediately. In this first lecture, I simply want to introduce you to the idea of rights. Now, whether you know a lot about medical ethics already, or whether you don't know much at all, one of the things that you should be aware of on reflection when you think about the topics that are standardly covered in a class like this is the idea that a lot of them involve claims about rights. To just think about a couple of topics that are going to be covered in this introductory class and that are often covered in such classes, we talk about a right to life. Certain people think that when we talk about abortion, a fetus has a right to life, abortion violates that right, and therefore abortion is not permissible. Other people think that there is instead a right to choice. A pregnant individual, according to this line of thinking, has a certain choice about whether or not their body is going to be used as an incubation chamber, so to speak, for a fetus. They also have a right to choose whether or not that fetus becomes a living being because we think they have some right over whether or not they're going to have further obligations to that being. Most of the debate when we think about something like abortion is over the competing status of both of these alleged rights. People who think that abortion is morally impermissible tend to think that that is because the fetus has a right to life. Taking that away from the fetus without very good reason constitutes murder and therefore abortion is not permissible. People who think that the right to choose is important tend to think abortion is permissible and should even be provided by, say, the state in most cases. And that's because they think that the right of an individual to bodily integrity indicates that that individual has a say over whether or not they have another living being growing inside of them for nine months, whether or not another human being is entitled to take some calories that they are digesting away from them, whether or not they are going to be incapacitated when it comes to certain tasks for a significant period of time because they're pregnant and so on. Okay. So I talk about this abortion issue because we can see that a lot of the claims that are typically made revolve around this idea of a right to something. The same goes for other kinds of topics that are standardly discussed in classes like this, other topics that we will discuss. One such topic is an alleged right to die. The idea being that if you find yourself with a terminal illness that you cannot possibly cure and that is causing you a great deal of pain or distress, you ought to have the right, according to some, to end your own life with medical help. So you have a severe terminal illness, you ought to be able to have someone help you terminate your life before the illness causes you excessive and unnecessary suffering. On the other side, there are people who would want to say, no, you don't have that right. And you don't have even more so the right to get help from other people. And this line of thinking tells us that doctors have as their duty to save lives. And ultimately, 
it isn't up to you or a doctor to decide that your life should be terminated. We should rather let nature run its course. Okay. Other rights that can count as medical, the right to receive certain kinds of treatment, the right not to have to undergo certain types of treatment. Obviously these days, questions about vaccination mandates are a big deal with some people saying, look, you don't have the right to refuse a vaccine and go out and about in public, including in many cases, hold your job because what you are doing, if you go out and about in public without being vaccinated is endangering the lives of others. Therefore, you don't have that right. And we as a state have a right to either vaccinate you by force. Of course, no one ever goes down this road because it's quite dire or somewhat less tyrannically. We have the right to give you options like either you get vaccinated or you lose your job. OK, this is another argument in which you're likely to hear lots of rights based language. So I want to start out talking about rights and also saying a little bit about how ethics operates as a philosophical discipline by looking at what I call a simple joke. Now, this joke is a joke from 1993. It's by a comedian that I didn't quite grow up with, but certainly when I was a teenager, listened to quite a bit. Uh, his name is Bill Hicks. Most of his routines are certainly not the kinds of things that you can share in a class. This one is an exception only because it was prepared for a bit on David Letterman's Late Show. Now, if anyone is familiar with Bill Hicks or his story, they may know that this particular routine, the routine including this bit, didn't ever air. That's because it was deemed inappropriate, not conducive to getting money from sponsors by the network. And it was deemed to be inappropriate and not conducive to generating revenues from advertisers precisely because of the bit that I'm about to read. So I call it a simple joke. I do that with some intended irony because I think that it's anything but in a certain way. So, you know who's really bugging me these days? These pro-lifers. You ever look at their faces? I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life. Boy, they look it, don't they? They just exude joie de vivre. You just want to hang with them and play Trivial Pursuit all night long. You know what bugs me about them? If you're so pro-life, do me a favor. Don't lock arms and block medical clinics. If you're so pro-life, lock arms and block cemeteries. I want to see pro-lifers at funerals opening caskets. Get out. Then I'd be really impressed by their mission. So that's a particular reading of this joke. I don't think it is the joke because I think that there's a lot more to a joke than just reading the words. The delivery, which I did a terrible job of, is a lot of it. Right? There's all kinds of subtle cues in someone's delivery that indicates how we're supposed to be understanding what's being said. Now, the reason I start with this joke is because I think it can help us to focus our intuitions and our thoughts about rights and can help us understand some of the terminology surrounding rights that it's going to be useful to have at our disposal when we move into the actual philosophical papers we're going to be reading. In order to use this particular joke for this purpose of sort of focusing our ideas, I'm going to be treating this joke as a kind of implicit argument. As an implicit argument, I'm going to be looking at the joke and trying to find certain implicit assumptions that work together 
to entail a certain kind of conclusion. Here, the conclusion seems to be something like pro-lifers are ridiculous. Being pro-life is, generally speaking, a ridiculous position. Perhaps it's even more. Perhaps it also includes the idea that pro-choice is the only defensible option. Perhaps this is meant to be a knockdown refutation of any argument or any of the most common arguments for the pro-life position. I'm not sure, right? And part of the reason it isn't, generally speaking, a great idea to treat a joke as an implicit argument is because a lot of times you don't actually know what the conclusion is supposed to be, okay? A lot of times also, it can be difficult to figure out what the implicit assumptions are. Now, interestingly, and this unfortunately isn't a joke, the same things that I've just said are true of a lot of philosophy papers. A lot of times when you read even a published philosophy paper, it can be quite difficult to figure out exactly what the conclusion is and exactly what the assumptions that generate that conclusion are meant to be. Okay, so part of the reason for saying that is just to say, obviously jokes shouldn't be held to quite the same standards as actual philosophical arguments. And in many cases, they're not even intended to be actual philosophical arguments in any way. But actually, in certain cases, they're not much worse than a lot of what gets called philosophy. So having said that, I want to treat this joke as a kind of implicit argument. I want to give a sort of proviso first, and that's that jokes, I think, are not best evaluated typically as implicit arguments. I think many jokes indeed rest as jokes on certain kinds of deliberate equivocation and exaggeration. Jokes, if you ever read philosophical or psychological analyses of jokes, they often tend to involve elements of surprise. A couple ways that you can generate surprise are by means of what is called equivocation and by means of exaggeration. Equivocation is a very common term in philosophy. It refers to the use of one term throughout an argument in more than one way. So the idea is you introduce a term, and when you introduce that term, it has one meaning. But then somewhere in the course of your argument, you either intentionally or unintentionally end up changing the meaning of that term. Okay, that's equivocation. Now, in this joke, there is a certain big equivocation that seems central to some of the humor. That is an equivocation over what the term pro-life means. So pro-life, in its standard technical 21st century sense, as it's used to discuss this abortion question, refers to a certain wish, desire, mission, we might even say, to protect an individual's right not to be murdered. Right? This is the technical sense of the term that we have in mind when we apply it to anti-abortionists. When someone says they're pro-life, what that means now in the technical sense is that this person has a certain objection to abortion and that this abortion objection stems from some belief that allowing abortion would be unjustly depriving a fetus of life. So that's the standard technical meaning that we normally associate with pro-life when we're talking about anti-abortion people as being pro-life. But pro is a pretty common prefix that is used to indicate a generally favorable attitude towards something. And life is just a standard English noun. And so despite the fact that there's a readily available technical understanding 
of the prefix pro and the noun life when put together in a discussion of abortion that means something like having a wish or an interest to protect an individual's right not to be murdered. We can also hear, when we hear the words pro-life, another meaning. And that other meaning might be something like having a highly favorable emotional attitude towards life. That's one of the things that pro can mean when put with any noun. People can ask you, are you pro Uber? And what they're asking is, do you like Uber? Are you pro Uber or pro Lyft? I'm pro Uber. It means I like Uber. Are you pro Los Angeles? No, I'm not. I hate it. I think it's a horrible place. Okay. That's one thing that pro can mean having a favorable attitude or a highly favorable attitude towards something. In this sense, pro-life would indicate that someone is in favor of their own life, that they're happy, perhaps. Right? And in this joke, Bill Hicks is relying a bit on that equivocation. These people say they're pro-life. They mean it in the sense of, we think that fetuses should be protected. But Bill Hicks is reading it in the sense of we are generally happy about life, are fans of life. And he's pointing out that they appear to be unhappy individuals. Okay, so there's an equivocation. And I think that I need to point this out because I don't think that Bill Hicks is an idiot. And I don't think this is a mistake on his part. Now, there's a difference between is something a mistake and does that mean that it was a fair move? Sometimes people can know that something is a bit fishy and still put it in because it gets a laugh. And that's okay in most cases, I think. But since this joke has a political and moral dimension, I think we owe it to ourselves to dig a bit deeper. So there's an equivocation here. Intentional or not, it's there. There's also obviously an exaggeration. Bill Hicks starts out, I think, with the quite sensible suggestion that people who are pro-life should not be standing in front of medical clinics trying to block people from going in or out, right? That seems to me to be a pretty straightforward uh, attack that lands. If you're pro-life, don't stand in front of a place that provides medical facilities, especially if those can be the difference between life and death for individuals, which abortion can sometimes be. Sometimes people need abortions because they will die otherwise. That seems like a fair shot to me. But the bit about picketing cemeteries is obviously meant to be an exaggeration. Now, I said at the outside of this slide that jokes aren't best evaluated, typically speaking, as implicit arguments. Lots of jokes are meant merely, I think, to alleviate drudgery or suffering, to break tension. There are things that I think can be called innocent jokes. You just want to hold something that's often taken seriously in life up for a certain kind of ridicule, so that you can diminish its power over you, right? We make jokes about death and sickness for this reason, because we're scared of death and sickness. And maybe that means they have a lot of power over us. And so we make a joke and that allows us to laugh and maybe it doesn't give us any real power over these things, but it can alleviate some of the suffering associated with thinking about these topics. But many jokes, and the one I have chosen in this case is certainly one of these, can also have moral or political dimensions. And when they do, I think it is appropriate to treat them as arguments with their own assumptions and conclusions. Doesn't mean it's the only way to treat them, but I do think if a joke has a moral or political dimension, we owe it to ourselves 
to ask what is happening. What I mean when I say a joke might have a moral or political dimension is that certain jokes like this one produce not only laughter, but also tend to suggest strongly a certain attitude that goes along with the laughter. Here the attitude is something like pro-life individuals are generally speaking ridiculous. They're worthy of laughter. Also, I suggested earlier, part of the attitude this joke might suggest is also that perhaps all arguments for pro-life positions are not worth taking seriously. I mean, if we're not to take seriously the people who generally make such arguments, we probably shouldn't be taking the arguments seriously, perhaps. I said earlier that there is a difference between whether or not we think a person is respectable and whether or not they give a good argument. That's one thing that, as I said, is very important to try to separate in your mind when you're doing philosophy. People that you hate, that you loathe, that you think are ridiculous, they can make good arguments sometimes. And as a thinker, you owe it to yourself to evaluate their arguments. Because otherwise you might not be able to realize certain things that are true. And so we don't want, in general, to move from this person is generally speaking ridiculous to everything they say is going to be not worth taking seriously. Sometimes that is not true. This joke has a moral and political dimension because when I laugh at it at any rate, I find myself associating that laughter with certain attitudes, which are similar to the ones I just described. And it is precisely when the laughter is accompanied by this kind of attitude that I think we owe it to ourselves to ask questions about the underlying arguments that might be feeding the suggested conclusions the joke is putting into our minds. Humor is very powerful. It can also be very dangerous. With humor, there's always an ability to say that you're just joking and no one should take what you're saying seriously. But we don't always need to take that at face value. Someone might be making a joke and really using humor to cloak an argument that they don't want to make in their own voice, but they're willing to throw out there under the guise of humor. Okay, And when someone does something like this, I think we do owe it to ourselves to ask, well, what's going on? It doesn't mean you don't laugh at it. It doesn't mean that you must shut this person out of your life now. But what it means is that you have some understanding of how this person is acting on your attitudes and beliefs. And you have some ability to critique what they're saying so that you can resist things that you think on examination don't follow from the argument they seem to be making. So let's do that with this joke. What are the assumptions here? Well, assumption one comes out in the first bit of the joke where Bill Hicks indicates what he sees as a certain inconsistency in the claim of certain individuals to be pro-life and a general attitude of unhappiness that he sees. So I say what grounds an individual's concern for a right to life, assumption one, will also ground a general happiness with life. So the idea here of grounding is on the basis of what, what facts about the universe or existence is this person pro-life? And the grounding for that for example, might be that they think life is so wonderful. And if they think life is wonderful, then that might ground their desire to protect it for other people. But if it really is the case that these pro-life individuals 
think that other people's lives should be protected against unjust deprivation because life is so wonderful. The criticism seems to be, well, why don't they show it? Right? If these people really think that life is so wonderful that we ought to protect it for other people, for fetuses that aren't yet even people perhaps, then why do they seem to hate it so much? Now, as an aside, this is not really itself a fair claim or observation that individuals who are pro-life are generally miserable. Right? Of course, when they appear on television, it's because they are standardly engaged in arguments about abortion and they consider abortion to be some kind of major atrocity. And so, of course, they're miserable. This is the same kind of bad evidence that people often try to use against anybody who has a serious objection to the way that society functions. So, you know, you might hear someone say uh, about a particular uh, feminist, for example, well, they look quite miserable. Why are they so miserable? It's like, yeah, of course they're miserable because th you're having them speak in an argument about something that is of fundamental importance to them, something that they think is an ongoing injustice that they are trying to correct. They're not going to be smiling. It would be inappropriate if they were. So putting that aside, though, let's just assume that Bill Hicks is right and pro-life people are generally miserable all the time. The question here is, is this a fair assumption? Is it true that what generally grounds someone's belief in a pro-life position when it comes to abortion is a deep feeling that life is wonderful and that it is always something enjoyable, something that they can enjoy. Now, assumption two is, I think, a fairly common assumption in discourse about abortion, which is one of the reasons I wanted to include this particular joke. And that's that if somebody is pro-life on the issue of abortion, they should have a generalized concern to prevent death. You often hear that kind of statement in discussions of abortion. If people are so pro-life when it comes to fetuses, why do they not care about keeping the infant alive once the infant is born? Or if people are so pro-life, why is it that these same individuals think it's perfectly fine for everyone to be carrying a gun? Right? Guns kill people. If you're pro-life, why are you pro-firearm? So that's assumption two here. It's connected to those other assumptions those other kinds of arguments. The pro-life are concerned to prevent death in general. If you're pro-life, you shouldn't just be fixated on abortion. You ought to care about preserving life in all cases. And this mission would be most fully served only if the pro-lifer went to absurd lengths to fulfill it. He says, then I'd be really impressed by their mission. There's also here a certain reference to uh, the fact that most pro-lifers are going to be in an American context evangelical Christians who can be assumed to believe in a God capable of resurrecting people, a God capable of healing people miraculously. And so there's a bit of fun being had here over that belief, right? Open up the coffins and wake the bodies up. If you're a Christian, why can't you perform those kinds of miracles? Clearly some of the early Christians as depicted in your Bible in the book of Acts, for example, we're capable of doing these things. Why can't you? That's part of the joke, too, I think. We can set that aside, though. The basic assumption here seems to be that if you're pro-life, you should be anti-death. Not just anti-killing, but anti-death. Now, let's look at these assumptions in turn and try to figure out how we test them. And as we're doing this, I want us also to try to think about how we would go about 
testing our own intuitions, our own implicit thoughts, feelings, assumptions about ethical matters when we're confronted with a question, a thought experiment, and so on. The lessons I'm trying to use this joke to introduce are meant to be generalizable. So assumption one that seems to be implicit in the joke insofar as we can understand it as an argument for a conclusion. What grounds an individual's concern for a right to life will also ground a general happiness with life. That was the first assumption. So question, how can we test this assumption? Here we are trying to figure out whether it's plausible as something that Bill Hicks is suggesting. But if I laugh at this joke, it might be in part because I'm accepting the assumption. You know, oftentimes if a joke contains an element that we think is wrong, that often is what causes the offense. The offense is, well, the comparison that you're making isn't fair. So if I'm laughing at this joke, I want to ask myself, well, what assumptions am I doing that on the basis of? Why is this a good diagnosis of the situation in my mind? And so I want to test the assumption that I've identified here. I can do the same thing in the case of a particular moral intuition that I have just on my own. For example, I think it's wrong to eat meat. Someone asks me, well, why? Why is it wrong to eat meat? If I've never thought about it before, how do I test that? Is it wrong to eat meat? Why do I think it is? How do I test the assumption? Well, one way to do that is to ask ourselves, is there any general principle, are there any general principles that might plausibly be supporting the assumption? So in the case of the Bill Hicks assumption about a certain connection between concerns for right to life and overall happiness, are there any general principles that we can formulate that would apply to more cases than this, but that would explain why I think this particular thing in this case? If there are such assumptions, what are they? Are these assumptions plausible? And if we're not sure whether these assumptions are plausible, we can ask us ourselves, what about if we apply them to other situations that appear to be comparable? Are they still plausible in that case? So to think about the case where I think eating meat is wrong, perhaps you ask me, well, why do you think that? And I reflect on it a bit and I come back with the thought, well, the general principle that makes me think that eating meat is wrong is that it's always wrong to kill a sentient being. Now, that is a reason why many people who don't eat meat don't eat meat. It's wrong to kill animals. So that could be the general principle that supports my intuition that it's wrong to eat meat. How can I test that general principle? Well, let's see whether or not I actually think it is valid when applied to other situations that appear to be the exact same in certain relevant respects. So to test my general principle that underlies my thought that it's wrong to kill and eat animals, let's think about certain cases of euthanasia involving individuals who are in persistent vegetative states. Individuals who are brain dead, comatose. Now, Non-philosophically, at first glance, if I'm just going about my life, I might not recognize that there's any similarity between my views about whether euthanasia in these kinds of cases are okay and my views about eating meat. But maybe there is. Maybe when I formulated my general principle that's supposed to underlie my objection to eating meat, maybe that principle would also apply to cases of euthanasia involving individuals with pretty serious brain damage. Why? Well, maybe some of the individuals that we're talking about who have the serious brain damage have capacities that are greater, mentally speaking, than those of many animals that I think it's wrong to kill. Maybe on any definition of sentient, the comatose brain dead individual is just as sentient as say a lobster okay now if it's true 
that the comatose individual is just as sentient as the lobster, and I identify sentience as the criteria, criterion that makes it wrong to kill, in certain cases, then it ought to be the case, if that's really the principle that underlies my objection to meat-eating, it ought to be the case that I also say it's wrong to kill the comatose, brain-dead individual. Now, there can be other reasons why I might think it's okay, like maybe I have prior consent, the person signs an advanced directive. But if I just think that sentience is the important bit, the thought here is that when I formulate my general principle, I want to test it against other cases to which it appears to apply. And so if sentience is what makes killing wrong, then it ought to be that the case of euthanasia and the case of meat-eating will stand or fall together. That's the suggestion here. This is what it looks like to test a certain intuition, feeling, assumption we have when hearing an argument or a joke or whatever and asking if it's plausible and then asking are there general principles that support it and if so, are they plausible and then testing those against similar cases. So. Here, to get back to our main focus, we have a certain assumption that is underlying the humor here, which is that what grounds an individual's concern for a right to life will also ground a general happiness or satisfaction with life. One possible way to formulate this as a general principle might be like this. We say that someone has a right to X only if we ourselves find X valuable in a way that is best expressed in happiness. So here, we say that someone has a right to life only if we ourselves find life valuable in a way that is best expressed in happiness. This is one way to read the principle that's doing some of the work in the joke here. Can I test it? Yeah, I can. I can try to make a comparison. I believe that some people have a right to assisted suicide. And this means that I do find it valuable for people to have this right. But does that mean that I need myself to be made happy by assisted suicide? Not necessarily, right? Because, first of all, there are lots of types of value in the universe, and not all of those values are best responded to by happiness. Right? So one of the things we might say is, well, look, the individuals who are pro-life, maybe they are actually quite aware of how valuable their own lives are. But happiness isn't always the way to respond to something of value. Some things of great value, in fact, can create distress in us, some great works of art. So based on that kind of work, trying to formulate the general principle that might be underlying the assumption here, and then trying to test it against other intuitions, I don't think this is a very good principle. I don't think it's true that we say that someone has a right to something only if we ourselves find that thing valuable in a way that's best expressed in happiness. A police officer has the right to arrest people. I don't think of arresting as something that would make somebody happy. Yeah. So that's assumption one. Let's look at assumption two, rights to non-interference and beneficence. Assumption two, the pro-lifer has a concern to prevent death in general. And this mission would be served only if the pro-lifer tried to prevent all deaths. What would be a possible principle that might underlie this assumption? Why might we think that if someone's pro-life, they should be concerned to prevent deaths, period, in all cases? One possible principle. Pro-life means both that one tries to protect rights not to be unjustly killed and that one tries to aid those who would otherwise die. That's one possible principle. So the idea here is if you're really pro-life, you can't just stop coherently at, I want to protect other people from being killed. You must go even further and say, I also want to keep those people alive and provide the benefits they need in order to be kept alive. This first principle is really a principle about the meaning of a term. Right? I don't think that this is a very strong principle 
it's not very charitable to assume that someone else is operating on the basis of it because this is a principle about how to use a word. So I think a deeper principle that might be at issue here is the second one. Whatever value is recognized by a mission to protect others from unjust killing would also be best recognized by a mission to aid them. So here the idea would be if it's really the case that I think there's some value in the world that demands my protecting people from unjust killing, that same value, if I really truly were coherent and consistent, would also motivate me to help people and keep them from dying. Now, looking at these two versions of the principles and just doing a comparison in other cases that I might have less controversial intuitions about, I notice that in general, when I'm talking about rights, I myself recognize a pretty fundamental distinction between what are often referred to as rights to non-interference and what are often referred to as rights to positive benefits. I'm going to go into some detail about this a few slides from now. The idea here is that certain rights are rights to non-interference. What that means is that other people cannot violate your rights by interfering with you. So in such a case, if I say that I have the right to my own property, this is a non-interference right when it comes to your behavior. What it means to say that I have the right to my own car is in part to say that you can't interfere with my exercise of my own rights over my automobile. You can't steal it. To say that I have the right to a car means that you can't take it from me unfairly. It doesn't mean that you have to provide me with a car. So what I'm saying here is that in many cases, I recognize that there's a difference between saying I have the right to X, where I mean you can't interfere and take X away from me, and I have the right to X in some stronger sense, where that means you must provide me with X. I think that in 21st century Western democracies that are fairly affluent, individuals have a right to primary education and secondary education. They have a right to a certain degree of health care. What that means is that I think the second thing, not just that I can't interfere with them when they're on their way to school or when they're on their way to the doctor, but that I think that the state has a certain obligation to provide these things for people. Okay. I recognize this distinction in many other cases that don't have to do with this right to life. Also in the case of rights to life for people who are obviously living, so not fetuses. So when I say you have a right to life, that demands first and foremost to me that I can't kill you, that no one can kill you. I not do it. That's what your right demands. But I don't think, strictly speaking, that your right to life demands that I provide you with food even if you would otherwise die. So if I recognize that you have a right to life, and I do, what that means is I'm not going to, to try to take that away from you. If you call me and I don't know you in the middle of the night and I'm in a foreign country and say you need to come back and help me right now or I'm going to die, I might do it, but I don't think you have the right to demand that from me. Right? So I'm saying here that when I look in my own mind, I think in general there is a big distinction between rights that you have where those are rights that I don't interfere with you and rights that you have where those are what I'm calling here beneficent rights, meaning rights that I provide for you something that you need to survive. So the difference between me not being able to take your life away from you and me needing to provide benefits that will allow you to keep living. So all of these things that I've introduced so far, just so that it doesn't feel like this is all quite random, these are all going to be distinctions that are going to help us when we read the papers that we will read in this class. I've chosen some of the things I've said here quite carefully with an eye to some of the individual papers that we are going to look at. So let's just think about some questions that are raised by this simple joke. 
first of all, and the topic of the remaining half of this lecture, what are rights? Are there in fact different types of rights? Do I really think on reflection that there are differences between rights not to be interfered with and rights to receive positive benefits? Do I think there's a difference between saying you have the right to life where that means I can't interfere with your life and that you have the right to health care where I think that means that the state ought to provide it? I hear those two claims differently. Not everyone does. What grounds an individual's claim to have certain rights? Is a right always underpinned by something of value that must be protected? If so, is it consistent to claim that someone has a right to something we don't find valuable or enjoyable in the same way? Right, so if I say that you have a right to something, on the basis of what? Is there anything in general that I think is present whenever I'm saying someone has a right? And if so, what is that thing? Answering this question is really important when we try to extend the rights we normally recognize in the case of a living individual to extreme situations like abortion and extreme situations like euthanasia. Right? Because in both cases, one of the ways to understand what the difficulty is is that we have a concept of rights in the case of a living individual. Almost anyone that you ask is going to say, no, you're violating somebody's right if you just kill them. The problem is that we're not exactly sure how to apply the rights that apply to standard living beings, to standard persons, to the case of a fetus. And so one way to think that we might make headway on that kind of question is to ask ourselves, well, in the case of a standard human being, what exactly is it that I'm trying to protect when I say that this right exists? If it turns out that in the case of a person, what I'm trying to protect is their sentience, their current conscious awareness, then if it turns out if a fetus doesn't have that, then it should be permissible to kill a fetus. Because the thing I'm trying to pr protect with the right to non-interfere its killing in the case of a normal living being that's awake and conscious, an adult or a child, the thing I'm trying to protect there isn't there in the case of the fetus. So problem solved. So these questions about what it is that grounds a particular right are going to be quite significant because they're going to help us to see when it's appropriate or when it isn't appropriate to extend our own thoughts about such rights to cases that are less clear. On the same line, further questions, is abortion more comparable to a case like murder or to a case of failing to provide benefits? If a woman chooses to abort a fetus, is she actively killing it or simply withdrawing benefits to which it, the fetus, is not entitled? Now this third set of questions about what rights are in play in abortion cases is also present in the comedic bit that we just looked at because in that bit it looks like there's a strong suggestion being made that if we think a fetus has a right to life that means we should also think that we ought to provide benefits to currently living individuals who need our help right and i think that you would be very inclined to make that leap if you thought that what was going on in the abortion case was the withdrawal of benefits that a being needed to stay alive as opposed to a killing. This will also come up in some of the papers we look at when it comes to abortion. So one of the debates concerning abortion has to do with what exactly abortion is doing. Is abortion really like stepping in and killing? Or is abortion more like withdrawing life support? and just letting the thing die. If the latter case is what's going on, then it might be that in order to be consistent and consistently pro-life, we ought also to provide all kinds of benefits to people who need those benefits to stay alive. Right? If abortion is wrong precisely because you're not allowed to fail to provide benefits to individuals who would otherwise die, then in being pro-life, I'm going to, in order to be consistent, 
have to provide all kinds of benefits to all kinds of people. I'm going to have to feed all of the starving and so on. Okay. But if it turns out that abortion is more similar in my mind to murder than it is to simply withdrawing life support or failing to provide benefits, then my attitude towards abortion isn't going to dictate anything about how I resolve, respond to the starving. So let's get right into the right stuff, the rights stuff. So let's try to get some vocabulary here. So what are rights? First of all, a general analysis of the term. Minimally, rights are a straightforward way, not always completely straightforward, but more straightforward than many, to allocate permissions and duties among groups of individuals. Whenever there is a right, there is someone who can, can't, or must do something. So now we're trying to define rights with an eye to looking at the initial joke situation and trying to answer some questions about it. So first step, rights are a straightforward way to allocate permissions and duties among groups of individuals. The idea here is that all of us being free beings have some things that we want to have permission to do, other things that we probably think others should have a duty to do, and that we ourselves should have a duty to do in certain cases. Sometimes the things we want permissions for, the duties we want other people to have, the things we want other people to have permissions for, and the duties we want to accept, sometimes there's a conflict. And rights language often allows us to discuss those conflicts in a meaningful way that can help us decide what to do about them. So that's what's being done in the first bullet point here. So let's look at a couple of standard cases. You have the right to remain silent. What does that mean on this analysis? Well, it means that you have certain permissions. Namely, you're allowed to remain silent. It also means, though, that other people have certain duties. Others have a duty. If I have the right to remain silent and you are a police officer, you have a certain duty. You can't compel me to speak against my wishes. If I have the right to remain silent, what that means is that you can't keep trying to coerce me to speak. More importantly, if I have the right to remain silent, what that means is that you, as an agent of the law, cannot use my silence now against me in the future, in court. So you can't say, well, he didn't say anything after the alleged killing, so that shows he's guilty. If I have the right to remain silent, you can't use that silence against me later. So here we have a right, and we have a certain permission attached to it. I can not speak. We also have a certain duty. You can't make me speak, nor can you use my silence against me in the future. These are two duties. Second right, children have the right to invent an education. This can mean a couple of things. First of all, it means that children are allowed to go to school. This would be like a non-interference version of this right. Children have the right to an education. They're allowed to go to school. I can't interfere with kids on the way to school. I can't stop them from going to school. I can't deny certain kids the ability to go to school. It also typically, though, means more than that, and that's that the collective or the state has a duty to provide an education for children or at least not to treat children differently in this regard, right? So it's either the case that most of us, I think, think, I certainly think this, that we have an obligation to provide primary schooling to everyone's kids and secondary schooling for that matter. And if it really gets to be the case that the state is failing so badly that we can't, I do think the state has an obligation to provide what limited education it provides on an equal basis. Right, so we can't say, well, this group of kids can have the education, this kid can't. It needs to be a, a, a approximately equal or equal. So there's a first step general analysis. I now want to introduce a certain set of technical terms that are going to help us to understand rights talk throughout the class. And I'm going to try to keep these terms in our minds throughout 
other papers that we read just so that we know how to use them. We have this tool. So the tool I'm thinking about, it's referred to as Hofeldian analysis of rights. Wesley Hoffold, a 19th century American legal theorist, he proposed a very influential analysis of rights that many, many people use when trying to get clear on what we're saying when we talk about rights. So Hoffold argued that most rights we recognize in everyday life are in fact molecular complexes, meaning they're not basic elements, they're rather complexes of different elements put together. Okay, so it's kind of like he looked at rights that we maybe think of as just simple elements that don't have any component parts and he observed that actually a more helpful way to view them is in terms of complexes groups of four more basic elements that's why i say molecular other people of course say this too the idea is at some point people realize hey water h2o is not an element it's a molecule meaning Water has different parts that can be looked at independently. It's a complex. This is what the analysis of rights we're going to look at now and sort of apply in this class. This is what it stems from. This recognition that maybe things that look like simple rights that you either have or you don't actually have component parts. There are four simpler elements that are talked about when we talk about this type of analysis of rights. Two of these elements can be referred to as first level. I'll explain what this means in the next slide. Privileges and claims are the first level elements that are most important to this analysis. Privileges and claims are first level and involve claims about what actions one is able to do and what actions others are obliged to do or not do. So a privilege is a claim about what you are able to do or not do, and what actions others are obliged to do or not do, those are called your claims against other people when you have a right. I'm gonna go into this in the next slide. There are also second level elements called powers and immunities. These involve claims about what others can do to establish or get rid of or transfer the first level claims constituted by privileges and claims. Sorry, I shouldn't have said claims there. These are rights over our first order rights. So this whole talk of first and second order can be very confusing. So let's just look right at it. And we can start out on the so-called first level. So privileges and claims, what Hofeld and people following Hofeld call privileges and claims are first level. What that means is that these privileges and claims involve statements that directly apply to actions and inactions. They involve statements about what one is able to do. That would be a privilege. If you have a privilege, you can do something or refrain from doing it. Sometimes you have a privilege to remain silent, for example. And claims involve statements about what actions others are obliged to do or not do. So these are called first level in contrast to two other things that are called second level. These are first level because they apply directly to things you can do or not do, or to things others can do or not do. Okay, that's why they're first level. Second level will be things called powers and immunity, and they will be certain abilities that individuals have to bring into being new privileges and new claims. We will look at what this means. So privileges, you have a right to freedom of speech. This involves a privilege. You have a right. In this case, this gives you a certain privilege. You are allowed to say what you want without the government imposing consequences. Now, the second bit without the government imposing consequences, this also involves a claim. So this right to free speech also involves a claim. So remember, what we're doing here 
is looking at a particular right that we recognize in ordinary life and observing that actually if we want to understand more clearly what is going on so that we can speak about this more precisely and more correctly and understand exactly what is happening so that we don't make mistakes in reasoning, if we really look at what's happening, we can see that this right that we sometimes talk about like it's a unitary thing, the right to freedom of speech, it can actually be broken up into two different elements at least. One of these is my privilege to say what I want. The other of these is what's called a claim. And a claim is not about what I can do in my own life as a result of having this right. A claim is about something that someone else has to do or has to not do. Okay, so I have the privilege of being able to say what I want. My privilege by itself doesn't exhaust my right to free speech. There's another part that's equally important, and that's that the government, another entity other than me, is obliged to do and not do certain things. Those things involve my claim. Okay, so I have a claim against the government. That's part of my free speech right. The claim is that the government is not allowed to impose consequences on me for speaking my mind. It's not allowed to impose consequences on you for speaking your mind. Okay, so you have a privilege as part of this right. You also have a claim that the government not do certain things to you as part of this right. They can't put you in prison for speaking your mind. You might also have a claim to government protection as part of this right. Protection for you when you exercise this privilege. So, as you can see from this case, what we talk about as a single right to freedom of speech can actually be more complicated than that. In the case of freedom of speech, it looks like our right is best understood in terms of both a privilege, something that I'm allowed to do or not to do, and a claim, something that others must do or must not do. Privileges and claims, we can say, generally go together. And that's because the statement that a particular individual has a certain privilege typically also entails the statement that this individual has claims against others. Okay, so again, if I say there's a right to free speech, that involves, on the one hand, the idea that individuals have the privilege to speak their minds, but also a further claim, a privilege, but also a claim. And the claim is minimally that the government cannot put them in prison for speaking their minds. If we want to fill this right out even more so that it's more robust, we might also have a claim to the effect that the government has to protect us. Okay. Now, if you just think for a second about this idea that rights involve privileges and claims, the claim part of this whole picture introduces an idea that we have rights in a certain sense in relation to other individuals or entities. What I mean by this is that when I really look at the freedom of speech I have, the freedom of speech that we often talk about or that Americans often talk about when they talk about the First Amendment is a freedom from government repercussions associated with saying things that the government doesn't like, right? So the freedom of speech says that Congress cannot pass any kind of law that would penalize you for speaking your mind. This is very important because when people talk about free speech, there's often a tendency to just think that there's some kind of abstract privilege that you have for free speech and that that entitles you to make all kinds of claims against other entities concerning what they can and can't do. But that is not true, right? If you have a right to free speech at all in the primary sense, it is a right that entails certain claims on your behalf against the government. What I mean by this is, yeah, you have a right to free speech, but if you go to your job and say things that your employer doesn't like, they can fire you. In the United States, they don't have to give a reason. That's at-will employment. 
They can let you go, okay? And you cannot say you violated my right to free speech in that case, unless you have some agreement in your contract that they're not allowed to violate your right to free speech. But absent some kind of contract like that, you cannot claim, look, you've taken away my right to free speech here. And that's because your right to free speech, insofar as you have it as an American citizen, it never involved any claim about what your employer could do to you or couldn't do to you. It's a right that involves a privilege on your part and a claim against the government. So the government can't put you in jail. The government can't fine you. Your employer can punish you if they see fit. They can just let you go, okay? This is why it's important to understand rights in this more complicated way so that you can see that we don't really ever have rights just in the abstract. There's always somebody whose behavior our rights are supposed to constrain. So privileges and claims generally go together. My right to free speech means that the government cannot do certain things to me as a result of my speaking. My right to silence means that the police cannot do certain things to me as a result of my silence. In neither case is anything really entailed about what other people might do in response to my silence or to my free speech. So let's say I'm committed, uh, sorry, I'm accused of a crime. The police tell me I have the right to silence. I choose to be silent. It gets out in the newspaper that I made no statement. Everybody in America now thinks I am guilty. Because if I wasn't, why didn't I say anything to defend myself? That does not violate my right to silence. Because no part of my initial right to silence involved any claim on the behavior of other people. Just people who are part of the legal system, the police, the judiciary, and so on. Okay, so... One of the things about getting clear about rights language is getting clear about who is involved in claims to the effect that I have rights. If we get this wrong, we can end up saying things that are not true and misleading. So the first two elements that are standardly taken to be part of claims that I have rights, one of them is a privilege. This means that I can do something as the rights holder. The other one is a claim, which means that some other entity can't do something or must do something. Next bit, powers and immunities. So powers and immunities are elements of rights that we can call second level. This is because they are certain abilities we have to bring into being different claims and privileges or annul, get rid of different claims and privileges or simply transfer them. So Powers refer to the kinds of second-level abilities individuals have to create, annul, or transfer their first-level privileges or claims, or other people's. In some cases, one person has the ability to create, annul, or transfer another person's privileges or claims. So let's look at some examples. So I have a property right to my computer. Okay, What does that property right mean on the first level? Well, it means that I have certain privileges vis-a-vis -vis my computer. Namely, I can use it when I want to. If it is my computer, it's my property, I have a privilege. I can use my computer. I don't have to use it, but I have the option. That's a privilege. I also have a claim against everyone else who doesn't own my computer. Everyone else must refrain from using my computer. If it really is my computer, I have the privilege of using it when I want, and I have the claim that you not use it. I might also have a claim over the police, the legal system, to try and prosecute anybody who violates my claim to exclusive use of my computer. Okay, so I have a certain set of privileges and claims as a result of the fact that I have a property right to my computer. So we've taken a right now, property right to my computer, and broken it down into two different parts. Privileges, I can use it or I cannot use it. Claims, you can't use it. 
unless you get my permission. Now, the permission bit is somewhat related to the powers stuff. I can create, as the owner of the computer, I can create a privilege on your behalf. You can ask me, Ryan, can I use your computer? And I say, yeah, you can use it for the next couple hours. I'm not using it. That's a privilege. You now have the ability to use the computer or not to use it. I can generate that privilege because I have a power. Okay, that's why it's second level, because I can call into being, bring about different first level privileges and claims. So now I've given you a certain privilege to use the computer. I can also take that away. I can annul it. I can annul the first level privilege. I can transfer the power. What I can do there is I can sell you my computer. If I sell you my computer, it now becomes the case that I lose my privileges to use it when I want to. Now you have the privilege to use it when you want to, and you have a claim against me and everyone else who might try to use the computer without your permission. Now you have a claim against other people using the computer and you have an exclusive privilege to use it. Okay, so that would be transferring. So rights, when we talk about first level components, rights involve privileges to do or not do something and claims to have others do or not do something. Powers are second level abilities to create, annul, or transfer certain first level, level privileges or claims. Immunities are just basically the opposite of the powers. Immunities indicates that certain other entities do not have the kinds of abilities over first level privileges and claims that are being asserted to belong to me when it is said that I have a certain power. So immunities are restrictions on the abilities others have to create, annul, or transfer first level privileges or claims one has. So you can't annul my privileges or claims over my computer. That's an immunity. I'm immune from you tampering with my privileges or claims. The government can annul my privileges or claims over my computer. If I commit certain crimes, for example, that involve my computer, the government has the right to take my computer from me. I now lose my privilege of using it when I want to. So committing certain crimes can mean that you lose certain property rights. I apologize that I'm, I'm sort of shouting. Those of you who had my lectures before uh, will notice that I'm shouting. It's because I'm still getting over COVID and it's, it's actually kind of difficult sometimes to speak um, for a long period of time, so I had to force it out. Um, apologize for that, I'm not angry. So let's look at this quick table just to get all of this together, okay? This table comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on rights. I didn't use that article when writing this. Um, a lot of this stuff I've covered before in other classes and I just sort of remember it, um, but it might help you if you want to look at it and you're not totally clear uh, what I'm saying. Um, so here's a table, the stuff about the computer I took from, from this so that it would go with this table. So you have, let's say, a property right to your computer. We have here four different elements, and this table is supposed to show us the relations between them. So your right to your computer as a property right involves certain first order rights over the computer. You have, first of all, a claim. Your claim always is going to be against someone else. You have a claim against others using the computer. Right? So if you own the computer, you have a claim that says that no one else can use it. You have a claim to that. You also have a certain privilege, and this concerns not what other people can and can't do, but what you can do. You can use the computer when you want. So your claim applies to other people and other entities. 
We might also add to your claim a claim that the government helped you protect your computer, that if your computer gets stolen, you can call the police and the police now have to come and investigate. That if you run into a police station with your computer, the police have to help you defend it. Things like that. Maybe you might also have another claim that if someone's trying to steal your computer and you're armed, you can attack them. You have the right to defend your property in this way. There's all kinds of, of ways that we can spill out further claims here. So the first order, when we talk about your property right to computer, we have two component elements, a claim and a privilege. And these you can see are related. If I have the privilege to use the computer and there's no correlative claim that affects the behavior of others, my privilege doesn't really amount to much, does it? If I have the privilege to use the computer, but that doesn't mean that no one else is allowed to use it without my permission, then do I really have the privilege of using the computer in the way that we normally seem to think I have it when I talk about property rights? And if you can just up and take it from my room and use it for four hours, it's not really mine. You know, if I give you permission, it's mine. But if you can just take it with no repercussions, then it's not mine. So those are the privileges and claims involved in the first order rights. There are also second order rights over the first order rights, meaning the second order rights enable us to bring into being further privileges and claims, take out of existence privileges and claims. So I have immunity against others altering my claim. So an immunity you can see is placed above claim. That's because it is something that affects what other people can and can't do. If I have an immunity against other people altering my claim, that means that other people cannot take it away from me in most cases, cannot transfer it to someone else. You can't, for example, sell my computer to Jonathan on my behalf without my permission. If you had, an, if you had a power, you could do that but I'm immune from your doing that. Now I have as the owner, not just the immunity against other people altering my claim, I also have the power to waive, annul, or transfer my claim, okay? I can transfer it, I can sell you the computer. It wouldn't really be at all useful to you if I sold you your com my computer without giving you the claim. Right? If I said, oh, you can have my computer, you can pay me, and that means you can have the privilege to use it, but also everybody else is allowed to use it. Right? That would be kind of like I sold the computer to everyone at once and made a fortune. Right? You can't do that. You can only sell your stuff to one person. Why is that? Well, in part because selling involves the transfer of claims. I can also just forfeit my power to my computer without selling it. Right? Maybe I don't sell it. Maybe I just leave it on the side of the road with a sign that says take it. The assumption there is that if someone else takes it, I now don't have a claim against that person using the computer. It's theirs now. Now they have a claim against me using it. So this is the little table. Now, the reason I'm talking about all these things is because when we start talking about rights, there's often a lot more going on than meets the eye. And when we start talking about whether or not an individual has rights, we need to be clear about what rights they're having. And that involves specifying as precisely as we can exactly what elements are involved in the rights that we're saying they have or don't have. There are also lots of complex cases that can emerge when we start talking about rights. And sometimes this element-based picture can help us. So this is a particular complex case uh, from uh, a book called Ethics and Practice. It's a textbook that is often used for normative ethics classes. Author by the name of Rainbolt, he talks about rights and he uses the whole Hoyleian analysis. Lots of people do. He gives a pretty good example of a complicated case where it can be useful to have an understanding of what all the elements of rights are so that we can compare different cases. So imagine you're a student Rainbolt says, and you buy a right to park in the university lot. So you buy a parking permit, okay, at lot three or whatever. Now, what you've bought when you buy this par parking permit, let's say, isn't the right to a particular space. In fact, you've just bought a little sticker to put on your dash that says 
that you have the privilege of parking there, but it's first come, first serve, and you don't have an assigned spot. So you've got a parking pass that doesn't entitle you to any particular spot. What does this right involve? We want to break it down and look at its elements. Well, first thing it must involve is you do have the privilege of parking in the lot. And as I said before, it doesn't help much to have any privileges without associated claims, where claims are certain claims against other people that require them to behave in certain ways so as to, for, to support the privilege that you have. So you have a claim in this case where you bought the parking space, not the parking space, but the parking permit. You have a claim against the university who must keep other people from taking space in the law if they haven't paid for the privilege. You also have a claim against other people who haven't bought a permit, who haven't bought the right. They can't park there. Okay. So what you bought is the privilege to park in the right yourself, sorry, in the lot yourself. You've also bought the claim against other people who now aren't allowed to park in the lot. And if it comes down to, well, this person's in a spot and I need that spot and they don't actually have a permit, you're not going to be the one who loses out, right? The other car is going to get towed. You also have a claim against the university to make sure that the parking lot isn't being filled up by people who don't actually have permission to be there. Okay. So there's a privilege for you. You can park in the lot. There's also a claim against other people who don't have permits and a claim against the university. But notice there's something you don't have in this arrangement. You don't have a claim against the university that the university ensures you will find a space. After all, we said that your permit entitles you only to first come first serve service. Right? So what I'm saying here is that this case is complicated if you are not sold a specific spot because now you're just entitled to a spot when there is one. The university must make sure that other people are not parking there who don't have the privilege to do so. Other people also are not supposed to be being parked there. But that doesn't mean that the university has any duty to make sure that you're always going to find a space. In the worst case scenario, maybe you get sold a space and half the time you can't find one. I mean, I think if you never find one, you can justifiably claim that you've been ripped off. Now, this is an important case because we can imagine that something like this actually goes to a legal trial. And here, what elements are coming up in your particular right that you think that you have acquired when you paid are going to be crucial, right? Because in some cases, you might be sold a particular spot. You now have spot 119, that is yours. In that case, the university is going to have a duty to ensure that you get your space. If you're only sold a permit though, they don't have that duty. They have other duties. And if the reason you can never find a spot is because they're letting anybody park there, then you can justifiably claim that they're not holding up their end of the deal. But if they haven't guaranteed you a particular spot and it just so happens that based on everyone coming every day who's supposed to be there, you can't get a spot. Well, you have less of a case. Contrast that against the case where you are given your own spot. Now, in this case too, we can elaborate. It might be that you are allowed to resell your spot. If you are, you have the power to transfer the right, right? That would be a power. It might be that you don't. Sometimes you buy something and it says that it's non-transferable. The university might also have a power to revoke your space from you. If you behave particularly badly, if you get into a lot of accidents on the lot, they might have in the fine print something that says that they can take your privilege and your claims away. Okay. If they can't, once you bought it, then you have a certain immunity against them. 
So this is just one case with different variations. We can see how getting straight about all of this can help. We could also consider the case of, say, someone who's like the president of the university. Presumably that person does have a special space. That person has a privilege to park in that space and has claims against the university lot to provide that particular space for them and against everyone else not to park in that space. So that is just an intro to this particular kind of analysis of rights that's going to enable us to almost look at x-rays of rights and see what they involve and what they don't. I now want to talk about a few other distinctions that pertain to understanding rights talk. One of these, which I've already brought up when we talked about uh, the so-called right to life, pertains to a difference between what are called non-interference rights and what are often called beneficence rights. So as the name suggests, non-interference rights are rights not to be interfered with. Non-interference rights are rights not to have others interfere with you, your life, and your property. Okay. The right to life is typically understood as one of these kinds of non-interference rights. To say that you have the right to life is to say that no one has the right to kill you unjustly, although they can kill you in self-defense or in punishment for certain crimes. Not everyone can kill you in punishment for certain crimes, right? The person who can kill you has to be an agent of the state because we don't allow vigilantism. But the right to life in this case is going to be a non-interference right. So this non-interference right involves a privilege. You can live your life. It also involves claims on others and on the state. If you have the right to life, you don't just have the privilege to live. You also have a claim against others who cannot just kill you, right? If you have the privilege you know, if I tell you you have the right to life and you say, oh, that's awesome. And then you come to me and say, hey, um, my friend keeps trying to kill me. Well, first of all, they're not your friend. But second of all, if I were to say to you, oh, actually, when I said you had the right to life, that didn't mean people can't kill you. It just means you have the privilege to keep on living if you can. You wouldn't be too happy, right? You would want to say, wait, it doesn't mean anything for me to have the right to life unless I also have the claim that other people cannot kill me. So... One claim that the right to life as a non-interference right establishes is a claim that tells other people that they cannot just kill you. There's also arguably another claim that is typically involved when we say people have the right to life, and that's that the state must offer you some protection if you need it. Right? If you really have the right to life as a citizen of, say, the United States or California, that rings a little hollow if you call 911 and no one picks up or they hang up on you. Or, you know, you call 911 and they say, I'm sorry, we're busy. Uh, you're saying someone's trying to kill you? Hold on. So, claims and privileges, the first order elements of rights go together. In the case of non-interference rights, the claims are going to be claims about what other people can and can't do to you. In some cases, what they must offer. And so we might think that even these non-interference rights often involve certain kinds of other beneficence rights. We'll look at beneficence rights in the next slide. This is a common argument where people say, well, the distinction between the two isn't really so solid because even in the case of these non-interference rights, if it's the case that other people can't kill you, well, you can't really have rights unless there's a state that's able to help you secure your rights. and if it's really the case that other people can't kill you, that means the state is obligated to punish them if they try. So there is a certain line of thinking where the distinction I'm trying to talk about here, and it's a distinction that's going to come up in the class, uh, kind of disappears if we keep following it. So non-interference rights, though, just to get it straight, first of all, are precisely these kinds of rights where the claims on other people are first and foremost claims about they can't do certain things to you. And if there are certain other 
benefits that you are entitled to from the state, they are benefits of protection. The state might be obligated to punish certain people who try to kill you or to defend you, but that is because that is necessary for you to be not interfered with in the relevant sense. When we understand the right to life as a non-interference right in this sense, though, the important thing is that it doesn't entail that other people have to provide you with the benefits you need to survive. Okay, so if I say I believe everyone has the right to life, you can't come back to me and say, well, hold on, you just passed that person on the street who was starving and you didn't give them any food. You could, and I would just have to clarify saying, well, no, actually what I meant wasn't that I have to provide everyone with everything they need to stay alive. All that I meant is that people have a non-interference right not to be killed. So when understood as a non-interference right, the right to life doesn't entail that others must provide you with benefits you need to survive. This brings us to so-called beneficence rights. Beneficence rights are more demanding. Beneficence rights involve claims to have others provide or secure certain positive benefits to you. They might also involve claims to non-interference, but they are beneficence rights in particular because the main claims they involve are claims to have other people provide stuff for you. So to look at a case that's typically understood in this way, when people say, that someone has the right to a primary education, this is typically what people mean when they say this. If you have a right to a primary education, it typically means both that you have some claim that others not interfere with your education, but also something stronger. This is the beneficence part, the well-doing part. It also typically means you have a claim that the state provides you with teachers and facilities. Right? So if I say there's a right in America, every child gets a primary and secondary education. If I said that, and then I refused to pay any taxes towards helping other people get that, you might justifiably wonder whether I'm really committed to that right or not. Because standardly, when people say people have the right to an education in this country, it doesn't just mean no one can interfere with them when they're trying to get one. It doesn't just mean others can't stop them on the street and prevent them from going to school as occurs in some countries, you know, where girls are, are viewed as not uh, able to go to school, or it's not right for them to go to school. Right? There's unfortunately too many countries where this still happens. When we normally say that children have a right to education, normally what we're saying is not just we shouldn't kidnap them on their way to school, we shouldn't prevent them from going to school. We're saying more than that. We're saying we should provide them with some resources so that they actually have a school to go to. That is a beneficence right. Okay, so a lot of what I'm trying to do in these slides is really give you some questions to ask when you're faced with a claim that someone has a right. So example, someone says uh, women have the right to an abortion. You wanna understand what they mean before you start arguing for or against their claim. Do they mean that women have a non-interference right to an abortion, which would mean that if they are able to afford one, they are able to get one? Or is it something stronger? Do they also have the right to be provided with the resources necessary to get an abortion? If it is the case that they have a right to an abortion in this stronger sense, who is that claim against? Is the claim against the government? If so, is it against the state government? Is it against the federal government? And so on. So it's important to know when rights claims are being made, are people claiming that there's a non-interference right only or that there's something more? is what's being discussed here, the provision of positive benefits on the part of other people as opposed to just non-interference. What are the duties and privileges involved here? And who are the claims claimed against? Who is it that has to do the things that secure your right or not do the things that secure your right? If you have the right to free speech, does that mean that people on the internet can't get angry with you when you say something they don't like? 
Does that mean that people can't defriend you on Facebook if you say things that they don't like? No, it doesn't. Because that was never part of the claim that you had when you had the rights to free speech. Now, one of the big things when it comes to the difference between beneficence rights and non-interference rights is that legally speaking, societies tend to recognize non-interference rights far more readily, far more often than they recognize beneficence rights. Right? So we do say that people have the right to life, but do we really think at least if we look at the way society operates, that people have the right to be fed or housed by others? I think plausibly the answer is no. In American society, I'm certainly going to get in trouble if I walk down the street and start attacking a homeless person. But I'm not gonna get in trouble if I just walk past them. Even if I look at the person and it looks like they're going to die if they don't get something to eat or they don't get you know, maybe it's cold. Unfortunately, uh, in a lot of places where there are homeless people, people freeze to death. This person might be going to freeze to death and I can walk past them and I can be aware that they're going to freeze to death and I'm not going to get in trouble if I refuse them shelter. I will get in trouble if I pour water on them and that means that they freeze to death, right? That's the difference between non-interference and beneficence rights. And it's just a fact about societies that people tend to think that non-interference rights are far more inviolable, they're far more important not to uh, act against than beneficence rights. That will also come under fire when we look at actual papers discussing these kinds of things. So that's a big distinction when it comes to rights. Next question, the question of grounding. Now grounding is a relationship that's often talked about in philosophy, one thing grounds another if it provides the justification or the reason for the thing that it grounds. So when we talk about what grounds rights, we're talking about what is it about certain situations in the world that makes talk of rights justified or legitimate. So we do talk about rights in certain cases. Grounding is the question, well, what is going on in those cases that makes that discourse appropriate or justified or legitimate in that case. Interest theories of rights claim that rights are grounded in the protection of some interest or benefit that an agent is entitled to. So let's say I believe in a non-interference right to life, meaning that I believe that certain individuals, beings, cannot be killed without good reason. What is that right grounded in means what is it that's present in the cases where I think the right is present that makes that right appropriate in that case. So one plausible suggestion when it comes to killing sentient beings, you could say all sentient beings with higher order consciousness have an interest not to be killed. Okay, so you look at all the beings that we say have a right to life in the sense that you can't kill them. And you ask, well, what's going on in all, all those cases that plausibly supports the claim that that right is there? And one plausible answer is that in the cases where we say there's a right not to be killed, it's because there is there a sentient being with higher order consciousness. So why don't I say that a fly has a right not to be killed. Well, it's because a right is not a higher order conscious being with sentience. And so the, the fly doesn't have the same interest in not being killed as a human being would. Therefore, there's no right there. So you are a sentient being with higher order consciousness and have the interest not to be killed. Therefore, you have the right because the right to life that you have protects your interest. Now, if it's the case that an interest of a certain kind grounds a right, depending on whatever interest it is that we point to, other species, other individuals might turn out not to have the right. So I say, does an unborn fetus have a right to life? Well, if what I think grounds the right to life is 
the presence of higher order consciousness and sentience, then an unborn fetus probably won't have that right. I mean, I can draw the line when it comes to awareness and consciousness and higher order consciousness in different places. But if I draw it at a late enough stage of embryonic development, that's going to mean that the fetus does not have this right. Why? Because the thing that grounds the right in the standard case is the interest that a conscious, higher order conscious being has in being alive. That's what grounds the right in the standard case. The fetus case, that's not present. So if the interest is not present, then the right isn't present. Now, other people can say, well, actually what grounds the right in an individual case is a certain potential for future life. And you could say, this is what grounds the right to life in any case, in the case of a 30 year old. If what grounds the right is an interest in future, decision-making, future experience, then arguably that is a kind of right that can be given to the fetus as well, right? If it's future directed, if it's a question of conserving future potentials for things to happen, then the fetus has that too. Question, does a brain dead individual in a coma have the right to life? Well, arguably on the analysis where higher order conscious awareness is what grounds the right? The answer is going to be no, because if the person is uh, cognitively disabled enough so that they don't really know what's going on, then they don't have the kind of conscious and awareness that would normally give them an interest in remaining alive, and therefore they don't have this right. If I tie the right, if I ground it in potential for future experience, if this coma, if this situation cannot be reversed, that person is not going to have that potential either. So they also won't have the right. Okay. So this is a lot of material in a, a slide, but what I'm trying to get at here is very, very, very important how we ground a particular right, because depending on the grounds that we use when we ascribe it to a particular individual, we are going to get very different results when we try to extend it to other cases that are not obviously the same as our initial case, right? That's what happens when we try to take a right that applies straightforwardly to 30 year olds and then apply it to an unborn fetus. We can't unless we know what it was about the 30 year olds that made us say they had that right to begin with. If we can't identify that, we are going to make mistakes when we talk about extending that right to the unborn fetus. And there are different answers we can give here, right? Depending on who we are, we can say, well, anything that has a human soul has that right. Lots of individuals who have argued against abortion will say something like this. I don't think it's a great argument because I think that there is, when it comes to talking about political and moral and legal rights, especially about political and legal rights, there is a certain rule that one ought to appeal only to kinds of justifications that everyone could accept. We're going to get into this later on in the class. What this means is that if you're arguing for a right to something, you shouldn't be able to bring in things like souls that not everyone has good evidence for believing in. You might think you do because you have a certain belief system, but other people uh, don't. And there's a kind of unwritten rule that in a liberal society, we're not supposed to bring up those kinds of things when we're talking about these weighty issues. We're supposed to leave them to the side. Anyway, there's one issue with these interest theories about what grounds rights, and that's that some rights don't seem to protect interests at all. A police officer has the right as an officer of the law to arrest a suspected criminal. But in many cases where a police officer might do that, that doesn't really seem to be anything that has to do with the police officer's interest, right? It's in the interest of the law and the polis, the community that the police officer makes the arrest, but the police officer may not want to make the arrest. Maybe it's their friend that they need to arrest. Okay. So on this idea that 
rights are grounded by the interest of an individual who has the rights, this doesn't seem to fit. You could deny that they're rights. You could say, well, those are certain legal privileges that certain individuals have, and they're not the same as rights. They just look like them. There are different ways out of this, but this is just one thing to flag. Second kind of theory when it comes to grounding rights, it's similar but not the same as the interest theory, is called choice theory. Choice theories of rights claim that rights are grounded in the protection of some choice that an agent is entitled to make on their own behalf. So here it's not that someone has a particular interest, it's that there's a choice that should be up to them. And the right that they have is supposed to protect that part that says it should be up to them. So let's go back to the right to life. Why is it that uh, certain beings can be said to have a right to life? What grounds that right? Well, on the choice theory, what grounds that right is that all sentient beings with conscious awareness are entitled to make choices over the overall shape of their lives, including when and how they live or die. And so the right to life here on this kind of theory, it's subtly different than the first one. It's not to protect their interest in conscious awareness and life, their interest in life that comes from conscious awareness. It's rather to protect their choice to whether they live or die, and as a result of when they live or die, to what kind of life they have. In some cases, continued life can mean adding part to your story that maybe you don't want. If you have a degenerative illness of some kind, maybe you fear that people are going to come to know you as that person and for 30 years they will know you as that person and that might, you might think, serve to compromise what you did before that. And you want to have a certain autonomy, a certain control over the shape that your life has when other people consider it. And so you want to have the choice. So on this choice theory, there are actually several choice theories, but we'll just talk like there's just one. Rights are there to protect choices. Question, depending on how we ground a particular right in a choice, will, say, a fetus have it? Well, probably not, right? If we go to the choice theory and we're focused on choices that an individual has right now, on one reading, the answer is no. A fetus doesn't yet have a vested interest in choosing how to live or die. A, a fetus can't understand what those options mean. Now, if you're committed to this kind of theory, you could say, well, the choice that we're trying to protect for the fetus is a choice in the future. It's a choice that the adult will make. Okay. So there are always ways to get different results on different theories. That's just a feature of any theory about anything. You can always change different things to get the result that you want. This isn't just true of philosoph philosophical inquiries, true in science too, unfortunately. So choice theories also, though, have a problem similar to that that faces interest theories, and that is that there are rights that seem to involve no choice. There are rights to do one's duty where one doesn't have a choice. A police officer has the right to arrest a suspected murderer, but they also have to do it. They're going to get in trouble if they see a murderer and just go, oh, I don't want to arrest that person. So there we have a right. The right isn't to protect the choice of the individual who has it. In both the cases here of the interest and choice theory, the objection seems to occur in cases where one person has a right to do something to protect somebody else's choice or interest, but where the person who has the right and the interest or choice at stake belongs to somebody else. Anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. Further distinctions. There aren't too many left, but these are important. Moral versus legal rights. Many philosophers think it's helpful, I'm one of them, to distinguish between moral and legal rights. What's the difference? Well, moral rights are enforced by moral sanctions like praise, blame, inclusion, and ostracism. Legal rights are enforced by legal sanctions of fine, imprisonment, etc. So what I mean here is that whenever we talk about rights, we talk about privileges and claims, and if we talk about claims, we're talking about obligations that certain other people or entities such as the government 
have that are supposed to govern how they behave. All right? Like remember, if I have the right to my computer as property, that gives me a privilege that I can use it when I see fit. It also gives me a claim against your using it, unless you have my permission, and a claim against the government to help me protect this property right. But those alleged claims wouldn't be very meaningful if there was no way to enforce non-compliance. Meaning, if I say that I have a claim that you can't use my computer unless you get my permission, that doesn't mean much if there's no way for me to punish you if you violate the claim. What that means is that there needs to be, anytime we talk about rights, a kind of sanction. Meaning, there needs to be a procedure in place that governs what happens when someone breaks the rule, when they act against the claim. When we talk about moral rights, we're talking about rights that when violated, call forth or evoke a certain kind of sanction. That sanction is what I'm calling a moral sanction. So this means, imagine I say that you have the right uh, to be treated with respect, and then someone treats you with disrespect, if that is only a moral right, what that means is that the sanctions that will be applied to the person who violated the right won't be legal. We won't be able to fine them or put them in jail. They will be moral, which means that this person will be the subject of blame. We will blame this person for having done this. We will ostracize them, perhaps. We will say, you can't be part of our community until you apologize because you have been disrespectful. There will be repercussions that are not legal but that are interpersonal. We can fail to include them. We can, in return, resent them and be mean to them for what they've done. We can go by an eye for an eye. Okay? The idea of a moral right, though, is a right where there are consequences to violating it, but they are interpersonal, and they don't rise to the level of legal sanctions, where legal sanctions are law-based sanctions that are applied by the state and generally take the form of fines, or imprisonment, in some cases physical punishment, execution, if it's serious enough. So there are moral rights that are enforced by these moral sanctions. We're going to blame you if you violate somebody's moral rights. There are also the legal rights which are enforced by legal sanctions like fine imprisonment. Okay, This distinction is very important for some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Because there is a distinction between saying that there's a moral right to something and saying that that moral right is also protected by legal sanctions and is a legal right. Okay, so perhaps I have the moral right to being treated fairly by my family. What that means is if my family doesn't treat me fairly and other people know about it, they will blame these people, ideally. They have the right to blame them. I have the right to end the relationship without anyone blaming me. But if there's no legal right, that means I can't take these people to court for what they have done that might violate the moral right. This is an important distinction to have in mind because, first of all, in many cases, there might be moral rights that aren't recognized yet legally, and therefore there aren't legal sanctions. Right? So arguably, there are many, many such cases. Right? So for example, uh, prior to very recently, gay couples couldn't get married. They had a moral right to marriage, but that wasn't legally recognized. What that means is that if you were morally aware enough, you could certainly blame other people for not recognizing their unions, but you couldn't sue them over it. Okay, the state wasn't involved. Once gay marriage was legally recognized, suddenly that moral right also has a legal right attached to it. Now there are certain claims on other people that you have in virtue of being gay and married. 
a married person, which you can now be if you are gay. So this is an important bit because, first of all, there can be cases where legal rights need to catch up to moral rights, but also there can be cases where we think that there is, in fact, a moral right, but we don't think that that moral right is the kind of thing that ought to be protected by legal sanctions. Many individuals who believe that someone has a certain moral right to X may not believe that there should be a legal right to X. So, for example, if you promise to pick me up from work, I think most of us would say, I have a moral right now to be picked up by you from work, unless you have a very good excuse. But no one is going to say, or very few people are going to say, that I should be able to call the police and say, hey, um, John didn't pick me up. I need him uh, arrested. People aren't going to do that because a promise doesn't establish a legal right. If there's a contract, it does. But in these cases where you just have a verbal agreement that's a promise, it doesn't establish that. Okay. So one of the questions we will need to ask ourselves when we're talking about things like a right to uh, life or a right to whatever is maybe we think there's a moral right here. Is this the kind of thing where it would be appropriate to bring in legal sanctions as well? So last slide. There is another big difference, which we will get into next time, between rights and what is right or what is valuable. The word right is ambiguous, importantly. We say that certain things are right. We say certain things are valuable. We also say that certain people have rights. Okay, these, these are different claims. They use the same word right, but in different ways. So first of all, we make certain value claims as a part of ethics. We say, for example, a forest is valuable. The thing I want to point out here is that not all claims that involve claims about value also involve rights claims. So a forest is valuable, might be valuable, morally speaking, but that doesn't always mean that there are certain individuals who have claim rights against my cutting the forest down. Right? So I can say nature is valuable or this park is valuable. That doesn't mean that I can always translate that statement about what has value into claims about rights. It might mean that the park is valuable, but that doesn't mean that the value of the park can be exhausted by other people's claim to be able to use it. It may also be that I can bring value into the world, say, by taking a certain action like having children. Okay, That would make it valuable for me to have children. It might even be that it is right for me to have children. Okay, So maybe if I have children, they're going to be so spectacular and the world is so in need of a new generation that morally speaking, I'm obligated in a certain sense to have kids. That might be true. It might be right for me to have kids and wrong for me not to have kids. But surely no one has a claim right to the effect that I must have children. I mean, maybe they do. Maybe you could say that the current inhabitants of the state do. Maybe not. I mean, let's say that your claim that I should have children rests on the potential enjoyment that could be had by the kids that I would have. So let's say you say you have to have children because they would be so happy. You would be the best father and, and you're just such a happy person that they will be very happy and talented. None of this is true. But let's say it were. It might be true that it's the right thing for me to do to have kids, but a lot of us would balk at the further claim that I owe it to my kids who aren't yet born to have them. On the flip side, maybe it would be wrong for me to have children given that I have a rare congenital condition. Maybe I have some condition that I will pass on to my kids if I have them. So it's wrong for me to have those kids. Does it follow, though, that if I do have the kids, what I am doing wrong is violating some right possessed by the kids that I would have or that I am having? This analysis, which we'll see later in papers on this issue, it doesn't quite seem right. How is it that the kids that aren't born yet 
how can I be violating their rights if I have them? It's like, if they don't exist, then they don't have rights. And then once they do exist, did I violate their rights? There's conundra like this that, that appear. So anyway, the idea here is that not all claims that something is right or wrong can be captured appropriately by rights claims. Last example, maybe all things considered, given the number of starving people in the world, it's appropriate that I give to charity. But it doesn't seem like that means anybody in particular has the right to my money, to my charitable donation. Maybe it's right for me to give to charity, but that statement that that is right doesn't seem like it can easily be translated into statements about the idea that I have certain obligations in particular to particular individuals that might be called right. The person who needs my help and is one of a million can't say, well, that money is mine. I have the right to that money. That's not how it works. So let's just go back for one second and think about this simple joke and then we will be finished. So there's a joke here we looked at depends upon a couple of assumptions. First of all, the pro-lifers are not truly pro-life. Why not? Because they are not happy. And on one meaning of the word pro-life, being pro-life means that you are a fan of life, which should mean that you enjoy it. Should mean that you want your own life to continue. You want to get the most out of your life. That's joie de vivre. Okay. Now, I think that we have the resources now to say what is wrong with this particular assumption, this move in this sort of argument we have here. And that is that in order for me to say that someone else has a right like the right to life, I don't necessarily need to think that they even need to have an interest in being alive. To sidestep this move that Bill Hicks tries to make immediately, let's say I take a choice theory of what grounds rights. So someone has a right because that protects a choice that they might want to make for themselves. If I think that the fetus is an appropriate recipient of that kind of choice, which is a big if, I can say that, look, what I'm trying to protect when I protect the right to life that a fetus has is actually just the choice of a human being to decide for themselves whether or not their life continues or not. When you abort a fetus, you are taking that right away. But notice, for me to recognize that that choice is being protected by this right to life is not in any way, shape, or form to say anything about whether I think that life is valuable. Right? I'm just saying that there's a choice there that it should be up to an individual to make for themselves. If they want to off themselves, fine. But I'm just saying it's up to them and not somebody else. Okay? So that's one way that we can sort of sidestep this. We can say, look, Bill, the right we're talking about when we talk about right to life isn't something that you get because you think life is good or because I think life is good. It protects the choice you have about whether you want to live or not. That's one way to go. You could also say, look, just because I don't like my life, let's assume I'm miserable. Just because I don't like my life, that doesn't mean that I think everyone else is miserable and I want other people who don't have miserable lives to have those lives protected so that other individuals can't take them away. So what we have here are two different ways that we can block the move from I'm pro-life to I think that my own life is valuable and something that brings me happiness. Notice that I'm not trying to say here that in either case, what I'm saying establishes a right to life in the sense that the pro-lifers are trying to assert that there is a right to life. 
I'm only using the tools that we've seen to spell out why the reasoning here is not very good insofar as there is reasoning here. Now the next bit, if you're so pro-life, do me a favor, don't block arms, block arms and block medical clinics. That I think goes through. Right? I think arguably, if you are pro-life, that's either because you think that life is something that other people have an interest in, in which case, if you're really pro-life, you're gonna want them to be able to access medical clinics when they need them. Or you think that other people should have the choice to live or die as they see fit. You don't necessarily think they have an interest in living or dying. Maybe you don't think life is even a good thing, but they have the choice. In that case too, you're gonna to want people to have access to medical clinics if you're consistently pro-life. You want them to have the choice. So don't block medical clinics, that goes through. If you're so pro-life, block lock arms and block cemeteries. Now, this of course is an exaggeration, but it does connect with the claim that if someone's pro-life, maybe they ought not to be trying to resurrect the dead. Maybe they should be going a little bit further upstream and trying to provide people with benefits they need to stay alive. So making sure people have good health care so that they don't die or they don't have to choose uh, to die because they can't afford to pay their bills. Even this claim though, depending on how we view the rights at stake, is not going to be an obvious attack against the pro-lifer when properly understood. It might fail as well. Why is that? Well, because if there is a non-interference right to life that a fetus has, what that means is that the fetus has a kind of claim that no one can take its life away from it without good justification. But if the claim part of the right is only a non-interference claim, there is no suggestion whatsoever that the fetus is entitled to our support when it grows up into a person. And so you can consistently believe that a fetus has a non-interference right against being killed while also thinking that you don't owe to other people what they need to go on living. It might be nice for you to give it, but I can consistently say if certain views of rights are plausible and they're the views that I hold, it's not inconsistent for me, at least not obviously so, for me to say, I don't want this infant to die of an abortion, but I also don't care enough, or I certainly don't think I'm legally or morally obligated to help this other person stay alive. Because there's gonna be a difference, on this view at least, between the right I have ascribed to an infant when I said it has the right to life, and the right I ascribe to someone on the street when I say they have the right to life, meaning that I can't kill them, and the further claim that they have a right to be benefited by me in ways that they need to survive, right? Like I say, it's not necessarily against the law, and for some people it's not even necessarily immoral for me to refuse help. You can cook up cases where it's not even immoral. Like let's say there's a billion people that need my help and I can't help all of them and I only have 10 seconds to get to the airport. Maybe in that case, I'm actually okay with just brushing them all off, okay? That's very different than me, or at least to many of us, it seems very different and we'll explore this a lot in the class. Very different than me, you know, kicking someone's crutches out from under them while I'm running intentionally and making sure that they die that way. In that case, I've interfered with them. Anyway, I've talked a lot. Hopefully I'll be feeling better for Thursday um, and things will be shorter, but have a great day.